agree. Yeah. An allegory is an analogical tale unfolding a philosophical, spiritual idea or meaning, right? Presumably for our benefit. Go along with that? Right? Allegory of the cave in the upper world, any number of them, right? Therefore, there are two levels. If it's analogical, it's two levels. Two, le two levels with studies of interrelationships. Agree? So therefore, we could... Uh, <clears throat> now, this can either be... Right, this is not going to answer that. Let's assume it just has three episodes or action. <clears throat> then for each element in the story, well, there has to be a corresponding value to each one. So it's as if we had a plastic sheet and put it over the story. We should be able to transpose every single term and look for its corresponding meaning as well as for the drama. I got hung up a little bit on the for our benefit part over here. Well, um, I don't mind how high <laughs> were you hung. Well, what, what about, uh, let's say George Bush says that um, he doesn't want to get a hall pass to go into Iraq then he's using an allegory that he thinks is for our benefit because in his mind it's important that we do so. But it, it, it does unfold a philosophical belief that we are the boss, we're the teacher, they're the, the student. But then you don't have a question about allegory, you have a question about someone who doesn't know how to concern himself with an allegory. George Bush is not a teacher, he's a politician. It's not, a, not an allegory. Homer's trying to teach us something. It's not, it's not a, an allegory. If, if, if yeah. you're saying, I got one that doesn't fit, I'll say, okay, then it's not an allegory. Okay. So you're saying every bad attempt at an allegory, because it doesn't have the benefit, makes it not an allegory. That, or it doesn't have a philosophical idea, right? So there's no such thing as a, as a wrong allegory that has the bad spiritual idea or a bad philosophy attached to it. Aristotle can't write an allegory. Well, that's well known. <laughs> well, other than that, he's bad at it. <laughs> I mean, that's why it was called, you know, by various names, which I will not repeat. Oak, therefore, would you agree we're in Porky's Cave, right, from the Odyssey? And therefore, let this be the story. And he's taking it from Porphyry, and he's Thomas Taylor is paraphrasing it. So let this be the story, and then for each element in it. We'll look for its corresponding meaning, as well as any reflection on the whole.
that that should come only as a result of doing all that work, which is the same as a dream, nothing new. So this is why it's easy, easy to do this, right? Because you guys have read it, I can just say, okay, from the text, tell me where each one of those things are, I put it on the board, I don't have to work. That means I fulfill my father's promise, right? I mean, uh, order, <laughs> right, which is? Never work. Never work. If you can avoid it, avoid work. So, okay, go ahead, let's do it. What All we need is someone to make a statement of the myth, or the, pardon me, the allegory. Well, I had an experience. First, I read it, and it meant absolutely nothing to me. I think, well, this is a lovely fairy tale. Pardon me? That? I read the book, okay? It's not a big read. I mean, you read it no. in 20 minutes. Of course. And when I got done reading, I thought, well, this is an interesting story, and I got absolutely nothing out of it, although Good. I knew there was something Then it there. fails. Well, I'm that, glad that to hear that. That was the first night I read it. That's not the end of my story. So, oh, oh, oh. So then I kind of like said, okay, well, I'll just put this aside, and I'll read it again later in the week. And then about two days later, I got a flash. And I don't know if it's right or wrong, but my flash is that that this allegory, you want me to go through the whole thing? I mean, it came up with something. It may not, it's just a guess, but it came up that, that uh, Odysseus is, all these travels is like his life, his incarnation, you know, on the earth. And when He's laid down on the island on the sand with all of his stuff. Mm -hmm. That's after he dies or goes through transition. And he's now in the afterlife, after his physical life. And all of this stuff is all the stuff he learned through that life. And they're, and they're taking it to the cave, which is his, you know, that which goes from life to life. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I got out of it. Yeah, okay, okay. Let's do it now. Let's go through it, let's build it. Then you can see whether, whether whatever conclusion you have come to fits the material, that's all. It'll either confirm in one way what you say or what someone else says, and I don't have well, to. It's just what came up for me. Uh, well, that's okay, as I say. I, I know several people who have such experiences. You have, see? Colleagues. Okay, come on, let's do it. Uh, need a reader for the? Um, you know what, should I? Actually, this is, what do you think, your opinion? Do you think I should confuse this or add a bit of? Go ahead. If confusing it will bring greater illumination uh, later, uh, I argue for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. See, there's another level to this. Mm. Thomas Taylor and Homer. Because after we get this, we have to see whether or not this corresponds to Homer. Don't we? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. True. Yeah, because otherwise, we're making an assumption, and you know, be careful about such assumptions. Agree? Yeah, good, good. So therefore, we have to do it twice. All right. His way of doing things, his way of doing things, is a very interesting assumption. Now I'm going to call what these are, what we're, 
the values for a moment, okay? We can't do that for this, because there's nothing that came before it, 800 BC, but there's no information. So this would have to be internally. Mm. Like a dream, right? like Plato's allegory of the cave in the upper world. We don't check Platon Platonic tradition for the meaning of the allegory of the cave in the upper world. We use the whole book to see whether we can find in the book the values. So Homer is the oldest writing we have Pardon? in the Western tradition? Yeah. There's nothing older than this? Nothing older. This is it. This is the very first thing. Right. And it wasn't like Beowulf. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So one would have to be internal, just like we, in Plato. Right, what do we do? We must demand that all of the answers emerge out of the cave, uh, pardon me, out of the Republic, the allegory of the cave, and such like, right? So we have two things to do. Now, uh, so we need someone to make the statement of it. We could either go this way, see, paraphrase by Tom, see that? Paraphrase. We could then, we could then do this first, do this first, do that second. How would you proceed? Any difference, any value? We could make a comparison between Thomas Taylor's paraphrase and Homer, or we could line up the elements of the cave and see how he finds meanings, meaning to it by seeking out the way Neoplatonic thinkers have worked it or internally. This presupposes you're into Homer. <coughs> Therefore, we can only do one part of it. Well, okay. Go. Just volunteering to read the Thomas Taylor's. All right, let's go. You answered it. Two and five. Two and five. Okay, now, watch now. We need two things. We need a statement, the statement of the allegory, and then to see how he then breaks it down for the so called variables in order to find out their value. Okay, okay. What page? <clears throat> 205. 205? What page? 205. <clears throat> When you're ready at any time. What are we to understand by the cave? Or should I start on number seven? 205, number seven. Jump in. Okay. In the last place, we may deservedly rank among the theological writings of Porphyry his treatise concerning the cave of the Nuns in the 13th book of the Odyssey. This admirable work is fortunately preserved, and as it contains some deep arcana of the natural and symbol symbolical theology of the ancients, together with some beautiful observations respecting the allegory of Odysseus, I persuade myself the following paraphrased translation of this work will 
will be acceptable to the lovers of English learning and philosophy. Okay. Hypothesis. All right. 205 will get us that. <clears throat> then would you agree we then line up all of those elements? What are we to understand by the cave in the island of Ithaca, which Homer describes in the following verses? Uh, yeah, uh, where are you reading? Page 205. Okay, keep going, please. High at the head, a branching olive grows. Okay, you'd say this is the statement on page 205. I understand that is the statement you're putting forward. Well, I haven't been here on many of these Friday nights recently, and I took your introduction to mean that you wanted to do go into this. If this isn't the right place, please correct me. I don't know where you want to be. Okay. Just go ahead. Let's use this 205 as we're proceeding, okay? And you then I line up all of these ideas, and it may go beyond that, it may not. Okay? Doesn't matter. Because we can add to it later, right? Okay. Is there a better, hmm? is there a better uh, representation of the story in this restoration of See, it, you know, whether it is or it isn't, it, it isn't going to make any difference, you see, because we have enough to work on. And if we find that he's going to add anything beyond this quote on 205, mm -hmm. we better have some reference to it. So well, either way, it doesn't okay. make any difference. Are you with me? Okay. Like, if there's six, if there are sixteen ideas in here, mm -hmm. and in his treatment of it, his commentary of it, that's finding these values. If he finds eighteen things of importance, we know he goofed. Okay. Doesn't make a difference. Any any contrast. Therefore, you don't have to take it. You don't have to take any position at all. You say, "Here it is." It's okay. So now that we have that, would you agree? Now we can ask for help. Line up each of these ideas, such as olive, olive trees. Olive tree next. Uh, cliffs. The pointed cliffs with shady boughs. Right. The shade. The shade of the. Right. Olive. In other words, you can line up, this is called the furniture of the myth, objects. Agree? A cavern. It can be described in a variety of ways, but that doesn't matter, right? These are the objects. Go ahead, would you agree? Right. Olive, tr olive, olive tree. Olive trees, they have sh shade. Cliffs, Cliffs, right? Cavern, go ahead. The shade, the cavern. Go involved in night. It Therefore, uh, no, no, don't read it. Oh. Just holler what you think might be the objects. Mm -hmm. You offer it another one. Okay. Night. The night. Right? In Underground. other words, any noun. Underground. The Naides. Yeah, go ahead. There's bees. Come on, anybody. Yeah, come there's on. bees in there. Yeah, go ahead, bees. Come on. This is the furniture, the objects. Ferns. Agree? Grotto. Two Grotto, grotto. come on, right? Got them all. Gate. Gate. Yeah, got them all. The honey. Okay. Let us assume she's finished. North and south. Okay, agree? Let us assume she's finished. Okay, guys. Go for it. Now you have to go through his commentary and line up what he says about each of these things, and we can see how careful he is in his analysis by matching them up and seeing whether his conclusion follows from the material he's developed. Okay. And if he leaves anything out, you and I, we can have fun criticizing him or be in awe that he only missed one or something or laugh. Okay, question.
Is this the way he proceeds as well in the essay? It looks like he has the, Pardon me? the myth. It looks like he has the myth. Okay. And paraphrase and then and, and analysis in other words, of the terms. With each of these objects. We could put it, we could cut out or uh, Xerox, right, or, right? And literally paste what each of these is represented in the text, yes. could, couldn't we? Yeah. Right? Just cut and paste job with a computer. Quick. Right. So Snap. Next, Agree? Snap. So the next paragraph is what he, how he understands, how he sees the paragraph. Oh, the next paragraph in the book, page 206, how Thomas Taylor then figures this out, what he sees in this myth. In the next paragraph. Actually, I think in the next paragraph he adds to it as well. Uh oh. No, 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 it's not okay. Okay, come on, it's perfectly okay. Read it, go ahead. An olive with spreading branches stands at the head of the Ithacansian port. Oh, stop. Is that in the statement that was just read? No. Okay. That there he's was a port? He's telling no. us well, how it's So he's adding, isn't he? That's good to know. Ah, so we can add it, see? Go ahead. And near it is a cave, both pleasant and obscure, which is sacred to the nymphs, who are called the naiads. So he helps us there, too. He adds. Within the cavern, bowls and capacious amphora are formed from stone in which the bees deposit their delicious honey. There are likewise within the cave long stony beams on which the nymphs weave purple webs wonderful to the sight. Perpetual waters flow within the grotto, but there are two gates, one towards the north. Okay, let me ask you a question. Okay. Descending. Yeah, okay. Is he just taking that material that he just quoted and reporting it, adding to a couple of a couple of ideas. Yes. Right. That's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So long as that can be found in the story itself. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Like, did he tell us anything more about any of these items he just mentioned? Did, did yes. he add anything about the way they function? Would you agree there's some things in this story he hasn't discussed in this paragraph? Yes. Agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. We don't have to criticize him at this point so long as he deals with it later, but we can watch for it. Agree? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Such as? He left out the shape, the function of the olive uh, Also the waters. The, kind, the way in which he described the waters are different. And the nectar, the nectar-like quality of the honey. Is yes, yes, yes. Okay. Hmm. Now, uh, I interrupted you. Could you finish that last line, please? But there are two gates. One towards the north gives entrance to mortals descending, but the other towards the south, which is more divine is impervious to mankind and alone affords a passage to ascending and Therefore, can you say anything about the nature of the cave from that conclusion? Mm, yes, it's a conveyor. It's Come a on, someone there. else? Right, it's, it's two, there's two portals. There's a, there's, a, there's a north and a south to it. That's it. It looks like the meadow. Well, he says something about it. would be on the meadow? Sounds like the meadow and the allegory. Okay, come on. Please. On page 208, uh, halfway down the page, Thomas, uh, what's his name, says, the world therefore may with great propriety be called a cave. Yeah. Yeah. Page yeah. 208, a little up more than halfway yeah. down. He tells us what the cave yeah. is. Yeah. 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 Look here. <clears throat> um, but there are two gates. 
one towards the north, gives entrance to mortals descending, but the other towards the south, which is more divine, is impervious to mankind and alone affords a passage to ascending immortals. Hey, one is going, ascends to the immortals. What? And what's the other one doing? Descending. Immortals descending. That's right. What's that called? How does that relate to the myth of Ur? <laughs> it does relate. By, uh, What's the difference? There's more detail in the myth of Ur. There's si the sirens, there's a judgment. There's, well, mortals there's can... more souls there. So. The opposite. It's the opposite direction, isn't it? Yeah. Mortals can go both up and down. Right, yeah, yeah that too. Earth. They can toil under the earth and they can go up into the earth. So would that be the evolution or devolution of one's life, depending on their su the success of the lifetime they're having? Is that what he's talking about? I, I don't even, right? Pierre? You have to make a conclusion. Right, it's, yeah, well, from the, from the uh, north, it's the descent of the souls of he, into the humanity. Of the now, world. this is why translators are a problem. Mm -hmm. See, he paraphrased that mortals and immortals. Different translations take it entirely <coughs> different ways. So if you have other translations of Homer, take a look and you can see your soul. Now, it's not that I don't like what he did, but it better in some way reflect this dude called Homer. But see, it doesn't even have the, have the ascending or descending in that phrase that we just quoted. I mean, he either left it out of Homer and added it to his own paraphrase, or well, because it's not in his direct quote, no. the idea of ascending or descending. You mean it's not in the quote on page 205? Correct. Okay, it, it, that's it, true, it, it, but it there's still it. two oh. questions, though. Yeah. It refers to it. Yeah. It says that the last look to the north is pervious by mankind. Oh. The lofty gate and the sacred south. south. Immortals. Two on page it two say that they go up or down. It doesn't well, say that there's a. Say, look, it see. may oh, talk about it later. That's pretty. But it does say that there's one. Okay, let, let me make sure we're together, okay? However, that point goes. Would it be important to know whether or not other translators translate it the way Thomas Taylor translates, especially these two ideas descending mortals and ascending immortals? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he takes this, he takes the way in which you see it in this text. That's his paraphrase. That's not out of that, as you said, it's not literally out of that quote. So that's, that's why he says it's a paraphrase. See, he's paraphrasing it in terms of the history of the Platonic tradition. That's what he's saying. That's what he's doing. That's what he says he's doing. That's what he's doing. Okay, look, would you agree now we can search for every single reference, just as we mentioned a short while ago? And we can also get the meaning of it, the pointing east or west, north or south, and all of these discussions. That's the way it functions, right? We think we have that. That's here, right, right. So why don't you just get a whole bunch of them and tell me what you found? <coughs> or the naid, naids? Oh, hey, let me take a break for a moment, okay? Because I had enough of those. Um, you find that, you know what's interesting about the Gospel of uh, Mark? It has 667 verses in it. And the last 12, of course, have been added 400 years later. Therefore, it really ends at 16.8. I have a friend of mine who added up all the verses. 
the members of them. And uh, he's a mathematician, and all mathematicians are a little strange, aren't they? <laughs> right? I mean, they're not like us. No. Definitely. Right? Definitely. Right. Good. Because he decided to divide that total number by two. And rem remarkably, when you divide something by two, it means you have two halves. Right? Usually. Oh, by the way, if you divide the two in halves and you take a look at exactly that halfway mark, that's the transfiguration scene of Jesus on the mountain with divine luminosity, out of which Moses and Elijah talk and have a dialogue, and the middle of it is Jesus. Find that interesting right in the middle? Oh, by the way, everything that follows from the middle becomes more and more dangerous. Danger increases. Here, very positive. Change in scenery from here to here, from Galilee to Judea. It's a nice division, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Plato is the same, by the way. You can take all the lines of Plato, cut it in half. It's very curious. I just thought I'd imagine something to humor you. This is called a comic relief. <laughs> and if you, if you divide Plato in half, uh yeah, you'll find it. If you you'll find Plato's what? Republic in the half, you'll find a very interesting section. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot to tell you. How many chapters are there in uh, Homer's Odyssey? 24. Oh, 24. Oh, and it finishes 24, right? right. I wonder, this is chapter 13? Mm -hmm. In the beginning of chapter 13? Oh, I wonder whether or not it would, if you happen to watch the words, it might happen to hit right in the middle. Would that be curious? That would be curious. Oh, by the way, in a good uh, story, there should be an intro that anticipates the whole story. Mm -hmm. Like the figure of John the Baptist, he anticipates the whole story, right? Mm -hmm. Plato's Republic, right? Socrates and Agathon, I think we go down to the Piraeus. Right. The introduction of the first paragraph. Yeah. By the way, uh, what's the name of the cave again? Porky's. 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 Oh. Would it be interesting to know that in the beginning of the Odyssey, there's a discussion of this very cave? And this is the midpoint. Would you find that curious? Oh, and Zeus in his talk at the beginning knows the whole story where it's going. And through the whole thing, there's, there are many, many cases where people are prophesizing, predicting in a variety of ways, different kinds of divination. The whole book's about divination, rather curious. What would that mean, by the way? Well, what might it suggest that we might take a look at that? And luckily enough, <laughs> I happened to bring a copy of Of what? That's Homer's Odyssey. Uh, I'm at uh, chapter one, of course. The first two, a couple of pages, two pages, uh, 72 line. See, there's a relationship between Poseidon and Porky's. One is the, as it were, the father, the other is the son. The son right? yeah. One is of the great waters and the other is the rivers. Mm -hmm. um, so this whole dialogue in the beginning is between Zeus and uh, Poseidon. If you want to read chapter one, you have to get out of chapter three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I was suddenly reading, it caught my eye. Okay, I'll get where I belong. Um, 
See, let me, it's really the first, second page, so. Um, so Athena is talking to Zeus. The gray-eyed goddess Athena replied to Zeus, My majesty, O father of us all, the man is in the dust indeed and justly. So perish all who would do what he had done. But my own heart is broken for Odysseus, the master mind of war, so long a cast away upon an island in the running sea a wooded island in the sea's middle, and there's a goddess in the place, a daughter of one of those baleful minds, <laughs> knows all the deeps of the blue sea, Atlas, who holds the columns that bear from land the great thrust of the sky. His daughter, you know, will not let Odysseus go. Poor mournful man, she keeps on coaching him with her beguiling talk to turn his mind from Ithaca. For such desire is in him merely to see the heart smoke leaping upward from his own island, but he longs to die. Are you not moved by this, Lord of Olympus? Had you no pleasure from Odysseus's offerings aside the Argive ships on Troy's wide seaboard? Oh, Zeus, what do you hold against him now? To this, the summoner of clouds replied, my child, what strange remarks you let escape you. Could I forget the kingly man, Odysseus? There is no mortal half so wise. No mortal ever gave so much to the lords of the open sky. Only the god who laps the land in water, Poseidon, bears the, do the, bears the fighter an old grudge since he poked out the eye of Polythemus, brawniest of the Cyclops. Who bore that giant clout? Thusa, daughter of Porches, an offshore sea lord, for this nymph had laid with Lord Poseidon in that hollow cave, naturally the god after the blinding, mind you, he does not kill the man, he only buffs him far away from home. But now that we're all at leisure here, let us take up the matter of his return. How should he sail? Poseidon must relent for being quarrelsome. He won't let him go anywhere. One, glow, one god flouting the will of all the gods. So what is it? It's a discussion here of the same cave mm -hmm. and Porcus. Yeah. Right? And here, hey, let's save him. He's captured. Oh, he's captured here because of what he did in the cave, mm -hmm. which was to take the one eye out of Polydemos. So this is revenge. Mm -hmm. And this is the end of it, right in the middle. Right, rather curious, whatever that means. But it looks like that's curious. Now look here, see, we're back here now. Just for one, one thought, would you agree that all readers of the Odyssey are totally aware of what appears to be from chapter one on, this is all Mythical, unbelievable, literally, what goes on in the worst sense of mythical or fantastic. From this point on, it's different. He's conscious, he's deliberate, the gods are not against him, they're with him. He can then consciously seek his own goal. Here he's thwarted with all kinds of strange beings and things that are going on, much in the mythical. And now he lands in the cave. Is his choice to go one way or the other? Yeah. 
Uh, which way did he go, by the way? Did it say? Well, in this chapter, he didn't go in the cave. The goddess looked for a place to hide his stuff That's true. in the cave so that passers-by wouldn't take it away. I totally agree. Therefore, yes or no? Does he find a way out of the cave independent of these two? He doesn't go into the cave in chapter 13. Okay. If he doesn't go He's into the cave... He's still on the beach at the end of the chapter. Hold it. Does he go into the cave? No. Quick. I don't know. All we have to know is, did she put some... Hey, take a look. See, notice, you don't have to take any position. Don't. You Jump in, in the text. Let's you confirm. You mean in 13? Because I think the gentleman is saying, in 13, he doesn't leave the cave. So is your question with reference to 13 or with Both. reference to the book? Both. Well, definitely. In, out, stay. How did he get there if all of these are relations between the furniture. Sure. Now, while we're at it, just uh, look at what this guy does with it in chapter 13. Um, A couple of great analogies this guy can write, similes for um, There are two descriptions of the myth, or the allegory. Um, Oh, here it is. Um. See, there's if you put the two sections together out of Homer, you're going to go in a much more interesting direction than Thomas Taylor. Um. Okay, very read a page. Yes. Reference. I like this. Uh, one of my favorite uh, similes. <clears throat> He's describing how the boat he took, the vessel he took, from the fake ends to this Ithaca, and how the boat was then traversing through the waters. Right? Got the picture? Right. Faster than the fastest yeah. uh, bird. How a four-horse team whipped into a run on a straightaway consumes the road, surging and surging over it, so ran that craft and showed her heels to the swell, her bow wave riding after, and her wake on a purple sea night foaming. Hour by hour she held her pace, not even a falcon, reeling downwind, swiftest bird, could stay abreast of her in the most arrowy flight through the open water with her great passengers. Godlike in counsel, he that had in twenty years borne such blows in his deep heart, breaking through the ranks in war, now rode through the waves of the bitter sea. <laughs> right? Right. 
No, I, I, anyhow, it's one of my, okay. Uh, that night he slept, right? When on the east the sheer bright star arose that tells the coming dawn, the ship made landfall and came up islandward in the dim of night. Perkis, the old sea baron, has a cove here in the realm of Ithaca. Two points of high rock, breaking sharply, hunch around it, making a haven for the plunging surf that gales at sea and rolls seaward. Deep inside at mooring range, good ships ride unmoored. There on the furthest most shore, an olive tree throws wide its boughs over the bay. Nearby a cave, dusky light is hidden for those immortal girls, the natives. Within are wine bowls, hollowed in the rock, and amphorbia. Bees bring their honey here, and there are looms of stone, great looms, whereupon the weaving nymphs make tissue richly dyed as the deep sea is, and clear springs in the cave flow forever. Of the two entrances, one to the north, allows descent of mortals. But beings out of light alone, the undying can pass by the south. No men come there. Descending mortals and yes. ascending immortals. Um, of the two entrances, one on the north allows descent of mortals, but beings out of light alone, the undying, can pass by the south slit. No men come there. <laughs> right, different? Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, other translations, are, are they don't all agree on this one issue. See, how are you going to translate the idea of the immortals? So in here, you have to make a jump with Fitzgerald. Rouse goes in another way, and so do other translations. So I just wanted to show you that. See, it's a problem. Even, see, if a translator understands a work, he's going to make the right translation. But if he doesn't see the issue behind it, because we want to know, that's a sharp division. How does this fit? Because that's the pivotal moment captured by this allegory. So now he's going to try to prove. He's, this is what he's going to argue for. Therefore, he's going to go to the Platonic tradition to support this contention, and that's what he's doing. So in any case, my point in reading it was to show you... Uh, by the way, there's another description of, of the... Uh, Allegory of the Cave, it's not finished. I'm the allegory of the Porky's allegory. Um, see, Athena then comes, right? Athena comes in disguise as a young man, shepherd, looks like a king, a nice king's son. And so she engages Odysseus, and then they have a wonderful little spar back and forth, trying to calm one another. And then they both agree, okay, you did it, I'm doing it, yeah. Now she well, says... Well, he lied to her. He, he, made, he decided he would be very untruthful. He didn't recognize that person as Athena, so he made up this big lie about what he had just done, totally trying to deceive her. But of course, she, being a goddess, understood what he was doing. He said, just hold on. You know, I've, yeah, I've she, lied to mortals before. Now you're lying to me. Yeah. She lies among the immortals. He lies among men. Yes. But he lies throughout the book. That's his reputation. He's called Wily Od Odysseus. But that's what he, mortals do. We lie to each other all the time. No, no. He's, she, he is given the title of the greatest liar among mankind. Uh, Right? I mean, that's it. 
See, in a world in a world of men, where there, you know you, you go your way and uh, there isn't much law. How many times do you have to con your way in and out of things? That's what he does. He tells partially truth, makes up the other, and makes his way through life. Okay, but wait a minute. From this point on, what's he doing? But we'll see that. Okay. And now she says, oh, you don't know where you are, huh? You don't know where you are. You're in Ithaca. You don't know that, huh? Because she creates the scene where he cannot distinguish the nature of the place he has landed in, Ithaca. Now I shall make you see the shape of Ithaca. Hmm. Here in the cove, the sea lord, Porky's, owns there is the olive spreading out her leaves over the inner bay. And here the cavern, dusky and lovely, hallowed by the feet of those immortal girl, girls, the nadies. The same wide cave under whose vaults you came to honor them with hedicones. And there Mount Nilion with his uh, forest to his back. So she dispelled the mist, so all the islands stood out clearly. Then Odysseus' heart stirred with joy. He kissed the earth. Right? She's making him see Ithaca. Right? Mm -hmm. So would you not agree? It would be interesting to find out what Ithaca is. He couldn't see it without this transformation. Uh-oh. He couldn't, yeah, he couldn't reach it before this. Now he's there. He's in the, in the cave. He couldn't see. He didn't know he was there, and so she just disclosed it to him. Oh, I wonder what, why, what the condition are for reasserting the myth. By the way, the myth adds a couple of things to the allegory, doesn't it? Right. That he has known this cave before. He's been there before. And offered sacrifices there before, and he didn't recognize it. Ah. Uh -huh. And uh, the Lord God Porky's owns there. Right? He owns the joint. Right? And the bay leaves, the olive tree, the leaves are over the inner bay. That's one heck of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> right? Therefore, what to see? has to be important since it's impossible. Right? No trees over a whole bay. And so on. Okay, let's go. Anyone got one for that? Well, olive tree, olive branch, olive that's associated with peace. Fruit of life. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> it's the fruit of life. Pardon? It's life. Olive tree. It's the fruit of yeah, life. Yeah, okay, I'll go along with anything you said. Probably, probably associated with Zeus. That's why I'm called Pierre the Agreeable. He also, what? he also talks about it as providing a lot of shade, so it's it's a covering, or it perhaps obscures the harbor to the untrained eye. Well, um, That be an allegory within an allegory. The olive tree represents uh, Zeus's creation of the cosmos. Well, he does say. Maybe he says more. Mm -hmm. So he just he says that. Something is signified by the poet under its obscure disguise, who likewise places with a mystic intent an olive at the entrance of the cave. Page? 
207. But I don't see that that helps, except that middle of the top paragraph. Well, you know, he, he mentions it and says it indicates something mystic. Well, I'll tell you what, then. Um, Pierre? I have an idea. No, when I read this thing last Monday, I, you know, this is my first time here, I didn't read Thomas Trower. I just read Homer, picked it up off the internet, a 1900 translation by C.W. King. And I'm kind of glad I did, because all I read was Homer, okay? Not somebody's interpretation of him or whatever. And that's all I got. And then I went away from it for three days, and then I got an intuitive feeling about it, which okay. I still feel very comfortable with, okay. more so than his what he's doing here. That's perfectly good. So I think in the future, I would always want to read Homer first before mm -hmm. I read what somebody had to say about what Homer said. First, I mm -hmm. want to get my own impression mm -hmm. on what Homer said. Um, I'm not uh, doing very well with you guys. Um, I thought I'd get a whole bunch of re responses. Um, well, I know another way of going then, since we're in it. Uh, but I was thinking of page 220, if you want to look at it. On the top of the paragraph, right? Why don't you read half of that page and take a look and see whether he mentions the idea of the olive? He <laughs> starts with it. Right. Want to do it, Barbara? Sure. One particular, one particular, however, remains to be explained, and that is the symbol of the olive at the top of the cavern. Since Homer appears to insinuate something egregious by giving such position, for he does not merely say that an olive grows in this place, but that it flourishes at the head or vertex of the cave. High at the head, a branching olive grows, beneath a gloomy grotto's cool recess, etc. But the growth of the olive in such a situation is not fortuitous, as some may suspect, since it furnishes and contains the enigma of the cave. Finishes, sorry, since it finishes and contains the enigma of the cave. For as the world was not produced by the blind occurrence of chance, but is the work of divine wisdom and an intellectual nature. Hence, an olive, the symbol of divine wisdom, flourishes near the present cavern, which is an emblem of the material world. Mm -hmm. For the olive is the plant of Athena, and Athena is wisdom. And since this goddess was produced from the head of Zeus, the theological poet gives a proper position to the olive, consecrated at the head of the port signifying by this symbol that the universe is the offspring of an intelligible nature, separated indeed by a diversity of essence, though not by distance of place from his work. Mm -hmm. And by unremitting and ever-present energy, not remote from any part of the universe, but situated as it were, as, but situated as it were on its very summit, that is, governing the whole with perfect wisdom, from the dignity and excellence of his nature. But since an olive always flourishes, it bears a similitude peculiar and convenient to the revolutions of souls in this material region. For in summer, the, win the white part of the leaves is upwards, but in winter, it is bent downwards. On this account also in prayers and supplications, they extend the boughs of an olive, presaging from this Omen that they shall exchange the sorrowful darkness of danger for the fair light of security and peace. But the olive is not only of an ever flourishing nature, it likewise bears fruit, which is the reward of labor, is sacred to Athena, supplies the victors in athletic labors with crowns, 
and affords a friendly branch to the suppliant petitioner. Thus, too, the world is governed by an intellectual nature and a wisdom ever flourishing and vigilant, who also bestows on the conquerors in the athletic race of life the crown of victory as a reward of severe toil and patient perseverance. And the mighty builder who supports the universe by his divine energies invigorates miserable and suppliant souls, contending for the most glorious of all prizes, the Olympiad of the soul. Stop. Right? Hey, how many points is he making about the olive from that paragraph? Can you build it? Does he even go into metaphysics? Yes. yes. Right? Does he go into Jupiter? Does he go into mythology? Yes. Right? Or the gods? Right? Can you pull it all together? Not yet. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying is this. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you've got to do that for every one of these or you're not doing the game. Mm -hmm. Right? How is he doing it? He's saying, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to collect what I know about this. I want to bring it together, myth, metaphysics, divine wisdom, Minerva, etc. Or right? I want to pull that together into a unity. That's what that means. But he didn't yet say why it's over the whole bay. Right? The bow is over the whole bay. But that's certainly then over that entire area that she hides from him until she reveals it. All right? Okay. Let's do it. Come on. What do you see? Hmm. Symbol of divine wisdom. Yes. Hey, flourishes near the present cavern. The cavern, therefore, is an emblem, emblem, emblem of the material world. Ah! See, so in here has to be the cave. Let's put it here. All right? Material world. A whole bunch of things. Going to have a whole bunch of things. So you keep building it. Uh, in terms of it being over the cave as a material world, is it possible to take that as an of the intelligible? Yes, that's what he's doing. That's right. That's right. He's going to add that, isn't he? That's the metaphysical side. That's right. Does he also bring in Minerva or Athena and how she was born from the forehead of Zeus? Yes. Yep. Right? So he brings that in too, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay, look. Signifying by this symbol that the universe is the offspring of an intelligible nature. Right, separated indeed by a diversity of essence, though not by distance of place from his work. Right. Hey, an olive always flourishes, bears a similitude peculiar and convenient to the revolutions of souls in the material region. Ah, material region. Ah, the souls, right? This is where the souls run around, huh? Okay, more, more. Right. Would you agree now he goes into nature? Would you agree he goes into nature as well? Yes or no? Yep. Yeah. Yes. I'll tell you something about olive trees. For in summer, the white part of the leaf is upward. Winter, bent downwards. On this account also, in prayers and supplications, they extend the branches of an olive. Oh, ritual. Ah. Ah. They exchange the sorrowful darkness of danger for the fair light of security and peace. Oh, that's what it represents. Oh, exchanging the dark for the light. Oh, and peace. Oh. Hey, not only the light. Hey, you know what? The apple tree also bears what? Fruit. What's that? the reward of labor, sacred to Minerva, supplies the victors, and athletic crowns, 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 affords a friendly branch to the suppliant petitioner. 
The part he left out, by the way, uh, um, is that in the fall, it's a, a, the sap that runs through it is a potassium cyanide, a variation of potassium cyanide, which happens to be a, 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 a hallucinogenic. I don't really have any interest in hallucinogenics, but the girls, when they used to give oracles, and they used to chomp on the leaves. You know, that's because they needed it for their teeth instead yeah. of brushing their <laughs> teeth. They, well, for some reason. Hey, look at his conclusion. Thus, too, the world is governed by an intellectual nature and a wisdom ever flourishing and vigilant who also bestows on the conquerors in the athletic race of life the crown of victory, the reward of severe toil and patient perseverance. The mighty builder sports the universe by his divine energies, invigorates miserable and suppliant souls contending for the most glorious of all prizes, the Olympiad of the soul. How does that add to this? Isn't it very much like the, the scene of... Spiritual Olympus? Olympics, right? Spiritual Olympics. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, what are you going to do? Take all of that. Touch this. Now, as he goes on, he may, of course, when talking about other things, add to it. So you pick it up and you put it in there. Um, as an example, on page 221, he, he uh, talks about porkies, but in the middle of it, he adds something interesting about the olive. About in the middle of the page. On this account, too, a seat under the olive is proper to Elysius, as one who supplicates divinity and would please his natal daemon with a suppliant branch. Ah! Pretty fancy talk. What does that mean, Barbara? Uh, well, the natal, the natal daemon is a clear he, reference to Platonic food. He can be sitting where? He could be sitting under the tree. Is that what you mean? And at that moment, he's then a suppliant. He's a suppliant. Which right? may, I don't know the words. What's sub? Does that mean he's supplying something? Uh, it means he's asking for something. Oh, he's asking for something. A religious asking. Yes. A religious Pleading, asking, asking yes. praying, like meditating. Yes. Like oh, I see. Life. Go ahead. Yes. For indeed, it will not be lawful for anyone to depart from this sensible life in a regular way and in the shortest time who blinds and irritates his material daemon. Yeah, what would that be, a natal? Is that prenatal? Is that what they... That's his birth diamond. What? That's the one he gets in the, you know, they talk about in the... Oh, that's what it means. Yes, yes. Sir. Oh, I thought it maybe it had to do with prenatal birth and, and things birth, like that. No, no. no, okay. Yeah. His guide throughout life. Okay, what do we add? That uh, we added that the, it plays a role in his making a religious supplication. See. See, before he yes. talked about ritual, and now he's adding to it what yes. Elysius could what do at that ritual? point, sitting in such a place, supplicating to the divine. Yes. Ah, ah. The daemon refers to something else. Daemons are also the elementals, the, the sure. intelligences that exist in the physical world that support us. Oh. And he's saying that if you die too quickly, they, they get mad at you. They come back so that... They go. You get upset. They wasted their time. Yeah, That's right. So that therefore, I'd be careful about I, your daemon. When I, when I said that he was on the beach, he had already died, okay? So this is, this is the afterlife. He's already completed it. Yeah, in, yeah. I, I didn't get that yet. Maybe it's here. That he died. See, it's not that you cannot interpret yourself. Uh-huh. Anybody can, all right? We would rather say, what follows if we build an understanding of it strictly from a systematic unfoldment of the allegory? By the way, you might say, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really, it's not as good as mine, my interpretation, okay. Or it's better or worse, okay. But if you want to follow the principles of an allegory, this is the way to do it. 
then later you can say which is better, which is worse, why. First, establish it. Um, now, um, Now, there's a whole several pages also about uh, astronomy, which is astrology at those points. Um, what page? A couple of pages we can get Arthur to go over with us. But right now, okay? Like, suppose we want to go for the gates, these two, right? <clears throat> Would you at least go to 215 for that? I would. See, this whole orientation to the heavens, the whole orientation to the heavens comes down to this one line. Right? Looking to the north and the south, east and west. He's got the whole discussion of the nature of the heavens. And indeed... The gates of the cave, which look to the north, are with great propriety said to be pervidious to the descent of man. But the southern gates are not the avenues of the gods, but of souls ascending to the gods. Here. Point right, what's he doing? Souls ascending to the gods. So he, right, right, we've got our souls ascending to the gods, right? Here, from an astrological point of view, the south side of the horoscope is high summer, okay, at which time the sun mm -hmm. is well, at its greatest strength, which represents the spiritual soul. No, we need your help uh, from certainly page the bottom of 213 to 215. Well, it just struck me that the south is actually high summer oh. in, the, in the solar cycle. Mm -hmm. So where the immortality is, and the north, of course, is the, the you know, material world and its associations, at least in the northern no. hemisphere. No. Would you like to comment on the rest of this as astrological? Or well, but it just struck me about that south. I was trying to uh -huh. tell okay. in, the, in the horoscope, the sun represents the soul's journey. Okay, And the, its highest point is the south. Because it's like the, the, the solstice during the summer, which is June, yes. is south here Absolutely. in the northern hemisphere. That's very important in what he's describing. Right. That's absolutely right. That's right. In other words, when he's giving this story, he wants to position it in respect to the whole heavens. Correct. That's absolutely right. right. <clears throat> oh. Like, look, uh, we were looking at the idea of the cave. All right. 215, about five lines down from the top. Since then, the present cave, an eminent degree, right? In an eminent degree is a symbol, an image of the world. As Numenius and his familiar Cronius affirm, right? And this is where he makes that great point between the winter and the summer solstice, <coughs> right? So, agree, you collect, you collect, you don't judge it, it's all good, you want to put it all in. How about purple? My eyes just fell on a sec section on purple, on 212. Right, why purple? Geography, 
Uh, pardon me, uh, furniture of the story. Well, tradition holds that Zeus's color is purple. Okay. How about f five or six lines down? Who wants to read? But the purple? Daniel, how about it? And what symbol oh. is more proper from there okay. here? And what symbol is more proper to souls descending into generation and the tenacious vestment of body than, as the poet says, quote, nymphs weaving on stony beams purple garments wonderful to behold, end quote. For the flesh is generated in and about the bones, which in the bodies of animals may be compared to stones on which account these textorial instruments are fabricated from stones alone. But the purple garments plainly appear to be the flesh with which we are invested, and which is woven as it were and grows by the connecting and vivifying power of the blood diffused through every part. Besides, purple garments are tinged with the blood of animals, and flesh is produced and subsists from blood and two, that the body is a garment with which the soul is invested, a circumstance indeed wonderful to the sight. Whether we regard its composition or consider the connecting band by which it is knit Agree we could soul. cut out, we could cut out that section, stick it in purple. Mm -hmm. right. See, it, it's, it literally, it's cut and paste. And then what do you do? You sit back, Right, have a cup of coffee, right? And you look at your work, and now you can write a paper. You have all the material right there. Now you can create what from what's here. You can then bring it together, and you can say how well he's doing it, Come on, right? You can see what he's, how he's developing it, how he's pulling it together from the tradition. And after he does that, you can sit back and say, was it worth it? That's doing the allegory, his way. Now, uh, would you agree there are differences between this and Homer? Okay, that's his. That's what he called. That's why he says it. he's paraphrasing it for this purpose, because his goal is to show the restoration of Neoplatonic philosophy and the history of it. So he needs this. He's saying, "I can take the history of the Platonic tradition. I can make sense of Homer. I'll take allegory of the cave, Porky's cave, and I'll show you what I can do with it in this way." Someone might do something else. That's what he's doing. So would you agree we have some work to do for next week? No. Shall we do it or skip it? Skip it. Do it. <laughs> Come on, after all this work? Come on. What does it take from you guys? Come on. Bring it on. Work. Yeah, doing it. Yep. Then, if you do it, yeah. um, Look at his conclusion on 222. Nor is it proper to believe that interpretations of this kind are forced and are nothing more than the conjectures of ingenious men. But when we consider the great wisdom of antiquity, history of the Neoplatonic tradition, and how much Homer excelled in prudence and in every kind of virtue, we ought not to doubt, but that he has secretly represented the images of divine things under concealments of fable. For it is not possible that this whole exposition could be devised unless from certain established truths 
from the Neoplatonic tradition. An occasion of fiction had been given, but rejecting the discussion on this to another work, we shall here furnish our proposed explication of the Cave of the Nymphs, and that's where we would go next in section three. All right. In any case, okay? See you next time. What do you think? Thank you.